All right. So um, we all heard Jess today, right? I think in his keynote, he was clear about continuous delivery is possible, right? It is, uh, it is hard work, it is struggle. It's a struggle, but it is possible. And a key part of continuous delivery, you know, uh, is infrastructure and infra ops agility, right? You know, software doesn't make sense until it gets deployed into production and customers use it, right? And it, when, when it's in production, it needs to run well, it needs to be responsive, it needs to be available. And, uh, and when something wrong happens, you, are, you should be able to troubleshoot it faster, fix it faster, right? Without that ability, you know, no matter what quality practices you put into software, it doesn't, you know, serve any purpose, right? So uh, I'm going to talk about infra ops agility, right? So software is getting built, assuming that quality practices are being followed, then how does it, how can it be put into production and run well, right? And how can you, if something goes wrong, how can you troubleshoot faster and fix faster, learn from it, learn from production infrastructure using the right metrics and keep on improving your services. So. Um, so, and I'm going to probably end the talk with three key ingredients that which enables that, right? Which enables teams to continuously learn and adapt from running things in production, right? Um, uh, so, let's get started. A quick show of hands, how many of you are business leaders, uh, you know, uh, or technology leaders, product management? Okay. How many of you are uh, uh, operations engineers? All right, um, cool. Any tech leadership, operations, or developers, engineering? Great, cool. So I hope you all connect with some of the things that I speak about today. This is my journey. I started as a sysadmin um, late in 1999, 2000s. I you know, grew, I learned a lot from my peers and the internet, whatever uh, uh, happened in various timelines and things like that. And then from there, uh, I was able to manage teams both in terms of operations and engineering and things like that. So I'll come to that a little bit later. Uh, but first I wanted to show you guys this, right? This is a timeline of various uh, events that happened in the last 20 years, right? Um, so it's grouped into five years, like you know, 2000s, 2005, 2010, and 2000 till now, 2015 and few, till 2018. What do you guys infer from this? Any takers? Sorry? <laughs> okay. Any other perspectives? Cool. So, I mean, if you look at this, right, it, the the change is fast, right? Specifically in the last 10 years. Uh, in, in, in the last, say, 2008 onwards, you know, uh, ever since DevOps as a philosophy and movement came along, uh, then if you see the explosion of technology, uh, both in terms of your infrastructure, which is virtualization and containers and things like that, and then the tooling around it uh, to manage that infrastructure, plus you know tooling around observability, like monitoring metrics and things like that, um, and the cultural aspects in uh, 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 like you know a lot of these companies opened up their culture, like how Netflix operates, how Etsy operates how Valve operates and things like that, right? So there's a lot to learn, right? In this, so a lot has happened in the last 10 years, but have we, have we adapted uh, ourselves to that quickly, right? So this is just the technology piece, the same uh, timeline, but only the technology aspects. As I was saying, you know, in the early 2000s, we had, uh, uh, VMware was the only virtualization technology that was available. Mostly everybody was running bare metals. Uh, mostly all of them were handcrafted, you know, servers used to get deployed using CDs and then racked into data centers and then somebody would log in and change configuration files and things like that, right? And, uh, and then, you know, things evolved a little bit. Puppet came along around 2004, uh, which helped us uh, automate some of that work, 
uh, there were other technologies available at that point in time, like automatic automatic OS deployments via DHCP, boot P, and things like that. But uh, and then you know, uh, Zen and virtualization came along. People started adopting it to use better capacity, uh, use the uh, capacity of the hardware fully, and then. It, 2008 onwards again, you know, you see process virtualization kicking off, AWS, you know, coming up with cloud um, and and other toolings around those things uh, uh, started evolving, right? And lately in the last, say, 10 years, you see so much of services that have come and tools that have come that makes our job very, very easy, right? Uh, uh, and, and, and it's just that, you know, have we evolved with it? Have we... You know, have we con you know have we implemented that in our work? Have we, as organizations, uh, helped evolve uh, uh, the teams evolve? Right? Are our priorities right? Are our structures right? Do we have the right leadership? Things like that. Right? So, and when we say people, we are moving to cloud. We are doing that. We are doing this. Are we really doing cloud? Right? One of the things that Jess was also talking about today was. If you just take bare metals and then you know you start moving applications into uh, uh, VMs on the cloud, does it really mean cloud? No, it doesn't. Right. So, touching on the culture a little bit. So you know we had this uh, waterfall method, right? And everything was you know you have project product managers, business leaders come up with an idea, product managers things about. Uh, 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 how it should look, and then developers will do the functional requirements, test it, and then they give it to operations teams to you know deploy it and manage it, right? And that cycle broke with Agile coming, and then you know, and it took a while for everybody to adopt it, and then other things like so. Th exactly what Agile came up with was increased complexity on the operation side because in waterfall it was step by step by step, so operations had enough time to probably prepare. But in an agile world, things started happening much more rapidly and operations never kept, kept up because things were kept uh, uh, thrown, and throw, thrown at them, right? So the, with the advance of DevOps philosophy and you know, all the other you know, learning opportunities that we had, the books that come along, came along and the culture of various other large organizations which have done this very successfully, We've again, you know, we had uh, uh, the the profession has evolved, right? So sysadmin now they are called DevOps and whatever not, right? But these key skills required for people, engineers, operations engineers at that time and even now are the same. You know, the the requirement is still to you know manage infrastructure well, automate your work, and uh, uh, and 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 you know use your uh, uh, the time that you save to do you know better value added activities, right? So, that, but still, organizations achieve you know, struggle to achieve this velocity and agility, right? Particularly when it comes to operations, because most often the focus is on functional delivery of software, right? There is a customer requirement. Somebody writes a spec. The engineer writes the code, uh, tests it. A QA or somebody might test it. It goes into production and in whatever way it goes and then you know people forget about it right um, uh, but and when 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 they scale when they you know when the engineering team scale when a lot of customers start using that services you run into a problem where operations are not able to keep up with it you have infrastructure failing there is a lot of manual work you know you cannot do things quickly uh, and you know troubleshooting becomes hard and things like that though there are multiple reasons for it one is that there is from an engineering standpoint there is the focus is too much on the just the functional delivery of the code and not on how it is being done and how it is being run in production and things like that right so about me as I said you know I started as a sysadmin I'm I still prefer calling call, being called a sysadmin even though I moved on to uh, uh, a lot of other things like uh, leading teams and you know engineering teams and things like that. And uh, I have worked with you know uh, companies with the startup culture like Directa. I was there for about 12 years, um, and then I you know as part of an acquisition, I started working in a public company. So I've you know been with them for five years and you know understand how these enterprises work. 
And I, now I consult, I partner, uh, I partnered with uh, Excensio earlier called Agile FAQs. Um, and uh, I work with Naresh to, uh, uh, on uh, helping companies on the infrastructure side of things, right? Uh, my wife still calls me a mechanic, you know, because I keep, you know, fixing broken things around everything that I see because, you know, that's, that's just my nature of things, right? So I try to also keep this as buzzword, buzzword free as possible so that these are practical things that you can probably go back and apply uh, uh, in your workplace in whatever role you are in. So defining infra ops agility, right? So, you know, what does it mean uh, uh, when we say that we need agility on the infrastructure side, right? It requires these four things. One is just infrastructure as code, which means that, you know, you can, uh, uh, instead of going and clicking some button to deploy, you know, or create a virtual instance, you can actually write code to do that and spawn it, right? So there are a lot of tools available these days which lets you do that. And, and what it gives you is you get, you know, speed, you know, because it, you don't have to go and manually do it. It becomes repeatable you, uh, and it's reliable. It will not fail. Once you write the code and test it, it will not fail unless, you know, the, the infrastructure itself, like if you're using AWS, unless AWS is, has some problems, you know, it won't fail, right? And it provides you the right abstractions. You can, if you write code, uh, the right, if you use the right tool and uh, you use code to create your resources, infrastructure resources, it can be, you know, you, uh, used to create the same resources in any other cloud infrastructure, right? You could probably do it in the same thing in Azure or your own OpenStack environments, hybrid environments and things like that. And it uh, uh, forces you to adopt best practices, right? Um, and resilient architectures. The next one is like, you know, have we thought about you know, high availability, load balancing, how will it scale up, how will it scale down, you know? Uh, have you thought about disaster recovery, uh, you know, BCPs, do we test our backups? Backups are useless until you, you know, test it and it can be used in production, right? Um, and then when things do go wrong, uh, you know, production operations, how do we, uh, uh, when things go wrong, the observability, right? How do we troubleshoot? What, you know, logs we have? What metrics do we have? What monitorings do we have, uh, right? To go and quickly see uh, uh, what is failing and, you know, and the ability to fix it faster and learn from it, right? And production operations is basically, you know, you, it consists of how is software being pushed into, you know, infrastructure? How uh, are they rolled out? How do you uh, 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 manage change? Um, and how do you manage incidents when something fails, uh, right? I mean, is it usually it's a chaotic thing, right? If something fails in production, and like everybody is on call, we don't know who to call sometimes, and you know, it's it, getting the right people together itself will take for maybe 15 to 30 minutes. And once they come on board, like how do they know what, where to see what, you know, what to see, how to fix, right? And these are all things that can be uh, pre-planned. Right? These are all capabilities that needs to be built in the teams and in the organization over a period of time. And, uh, and it takes effort, it takes learning, iteration, we make mistakes, and then we, you know, we keep on improving that. Right? It often takes, a, a, it's a multi-year journey, right? but you've got to get started somewhere. Right? So we'll talk about how you can probably get started some, uh, uh, on some of these aspects. Another key thing you know, is in a you know, microservices kind of an environment, if you have many microservices running in a, on a cloud environment. And if you have multiple teams who are owning those microservices, one team changing something and deploying it could have a cascading effect on everybody else, right? Because they are all interconnected, it's a mesh. Um, so in that kind of a scenario, it's always, all, the software is always evolving. Each of these microservices are evolving. So how do you control? How do you know, you know whether they will function well in production or not, right? So chaos engineering is a process, is a method where you can learn these things in production itself by inducing faults, right? So you have the services that are running, you will go and you know, create, induce a fault, take down a service or kill a VM and things like that, and then you learn from it, right? And see the impact cascade, and it's a controlled test. And then you improve your monitoring, observability, and all of that, and your change practices or development practices, et cetera. 
So if this is what we have to achieve as an organization or a team or an engineering team, right? This is an engineering goal. This is an organization goal. I'm not, not saying that this is just an ops team goal. And if you just look at, look at this as an operations team goal, it doesn't work that well, right? So what, what makes it harder? You know, why, why cannot we achieve this, right? Why do organizations struggle to achieve this? So there comes the now struggle. We are always stuck in the now, right? So if you look at a business, uh, you know, you, there is a need, that, which is a customer's need, and then the business, which is complex, it, it needs to deliver on outcomes, right? A simple solution for a customer. And for that to work, you have all these units in that business which need to work really well together, right? The reason why there are no arrows in that is that I'm assuming that, okay, for this slide, that they are supposed to be in an ideal environment, they are supposed to work together really well to deliver on the right outcomes, right? But it's, it often doesn't work like that. It's often a spaghetti of stuff, right? It's like people, uh, you know, there is no collaboration. Everybody is a silo. Everybody is have the need. People, you know, things get thrown out of from one unit to another unit, and then it keeps going back and forth and things like that, right? So let's look at the, why does the, that, that happens, right? Again, if you look at the business as a whole, what does it mean? You know, what do you, what, what do we need to do to run the business? You have features, bugs, incidents, compliance activities, your finance controls like cost governance and things like that. You have people leaving your team, attritions, um, and you have recruitment efforts ongoing on the side. And it's all depends on the engineers to be able to contribute to all these activities, right? And uh, and. There, there are activities that I call building capability. So running the business, it, it works, it's imperfect, imperfect, things fail, we recover, we learn something from it, and, and, uh, and there's a significant amount of waste because there are a lot of manual efforts, there's a lot of collaboration waste and things like that, right? And no, often we don't focus on building capabilities at all. Organizations don't focus on building capabilities. Which, when I say capabilities, if you are in an internet company or deploying services that are being used by millions of users there, so you need to build those capabilities. You need to be able to manage that uh, code that you're writing in production well. And that requires you to nurture your teams, you know, give them the right uh, priorities, uh, give them the right technology vision and, you know, uh, and help them and uh, uh, achieve those things, right? And that's not uh, often the focus. So uh, the focus is always on the top bucket, running the business, functioning, functionally delivering whatever you know the, uh, the customer seeks. Or most often, we you know organizations tend to create things that the customer doesn't even need. I mean, how often have we seen that we get you know things that you know buy this, buy that? You know, we don't need that, right? You know, organizations push us to do something that we don't even really need to do. So a lot of features that the customers might not even want. So we might be building a lot of waste as well, right? So the, when it comes to the operations team, we spoke about this as an organization as a whole. This is, a, this is the list of uh, activities that regularly happen to run the business. And building capabilities never get focused on. And when it comes to operations team in particular, right, and if they are central in nature, if they are not structured right, you know, you have all these conflicting priorities that are coming to you. So management comes and tells you, hey, I need this capability, I need this capability. While PM will be saying, okay, I need this feature, right? That needs to get rolled out. Support will come up with you with the escalations that customers have, this is not working, that is slow, et cetera, et cetera, right? Dev teams have their own requirements. Compliance teams comes with you with now auditory requirements and all of that, right? And then there you have HR, talent acquisition and attrition and other activities as well and cost control, governance and things like that. So operations are always in a struggle. Right, you know, it, it, it's it's we say that we have adopted agile methods, we do sprint and things like that. But whenever the work reaches the operations teams, it's always the last minute, right? It's always a surprise to them, uh, uh, and it then operations engineers feels like and feel like they end up being a support role. They feel like they are in a support role where they are constantly serving the needs of a developer or somebody else instead of adding value and creating more. Uh, uh, automation uh, uh, aspects. Uh, so the manual work, chaos, all of that continues. Um, and it's, you know, uh, there is a lot of sense of helplessness and stress, right? Um, and uh, so again, the building capabilities, 
uh, turns out to be an implicit goal that nobody you know uh, 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 cares about and you know you get stuck in you know doing the same thing every day right and so and that's like one of the key reasons is again there is a you know a lack of focus from an organization standpoint you know to change that and build that capability right um, so let's look at how we you know the, the, how we did this you know when I was part of direct you know we had thousands of servers spread out across many data centers right this is this is some years old, right? And we were in this situation. You know, we were a small team. We were uh, uh, constantly, you know, uh, interrupted to on all these activities, um, and uh, we had to uh, get out of it, right? It was, you know, the only way we could get out of it was by saying that, hey, you know, we took a pause and said, you know, we're not going to handcraft. We're not, we're not going to do anything manual anymore, right? So we introduced Puppet uh, for configuration management. We just, you know, we got all the servers loaded up with that and then started with, you know, managing the basic operating system configuration files that way. And then we moved all the application configuration files to Puppet repositories. So that, that way, at least, you know, you have all the configuration files version so we could, you know, see the change. And then we could use the same uh, 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 code to for other servers that go in, right, for that particular role. Um, and then over a period of time, we improved it to use the right templates and you know uh, and, and make the process faster. Mon you know, configure our monitoring systems whenever we add a new server, it would automatically go into our monitoring systems, collect metrics and things like that. And a lot of our interruptions were also coming from changes, right, that go in without proper testing or without proper notifications to customers and you know uh, uh, things like that so we had to say that for a change we will have a very clearly defined process it's not the, it's not a bureaucratic process but at least it you know the engineer the focus is on the engineer you say you clearly write down what the steps are right what are you going to do on the uh, on the systems what change are you pushing what is your rollback you know and what testing have you done and that way, you know, we were able to control the, you know, the impact of changes. Customers were kept aware of whatever changes were happening. We didn't get too many support requests. So all of that, you know, reduced over a period of time. And our incident management was also bad, wherein, you know, people would be called at random times. There were no run books, you know, developers would, you know, push stuff. We don't know which developers to contact and things like that. So over a period of time, by improving these processes, we had you know, a clear way of working together, right? With our development partners, engineers, PMs, and things like that. So what happened is, your whenever things go fail in production, you have the right people at the right time. You fix the problem, learn from it, it feeds into your automation, and then that's a cyclic process that keeps going on, right? So, and uh, another thing was inventory. Nobody knew with how many servers we have, where we have, you know, how are they connected, which rack are they on? you know, and uh, which cables are connected to what and things like that. So in a data center environment, when something fails, you don't know where the server is, you cannot look at the server, you cannot keep going and searching, right? So we, we, we then, you know, we had to work on fixing that and then, you know, automate the operating system deployment practices itself. So when we rack servers, we used to rack one rack at a time, bar, you know, barcode everything, including the cables, the, where the ports are connected to, and that will go into our inventory system. And then the inventory system will, somebody will assign a role to each of the hardware. And then when they put it on the private network and boot it up, you know, it will get whatever it, it, it had to, uh, uh, applications it had to uh, be installed, right? Uh, and then, you know, so once that was done, you know, once the, it's a multi-year journey, I'm simplifying it, but it was at least, you know, six months to do the first thing, three to six months to do the first thing. And then we constantly improved using the same practices, the SLAs and, you know, uh, then we got in things like orchestration where we could do things across the fleet of servers if we wanted to do something quickly. Um, and we moved from a central silo team to product focused teams to work closely with our development partners and product managers and things like that to uh, be more, you know, uh, outcome driven, right? Um, and we did a lot of automation and things like that to push responsibility to the edges. So every request that would come in to us would, uh, you know, get translated into some kind of a automated tool that the support teams can use themselves or engineers can use themselves and things like that. Um, so over a period of time, we 
became much more operable. We became resilient in terms of having processes for uh, uh, HA, you know, fa failover, failback processes. We had di disaster recovery for uh, some of our critical applications in on the cloud. Uh, uh, you know, and backups, restores, all of that were tested and implemented and things like that. And so the, the entire goal was to, you know, improve predictability of operations, right? I mean, you need to, every change, every incident, every thing, you know, you just need to know who the right people are. You might not know the cause, but you can at least figure out, you know, uh, processify or, you know, make every other action of yours much more predictable. And um, and then or, so once the teams were set up this way, they had the autonomy, they had the outcome, you know, the goal of uh, uh, improving the product and had uh, uh, their only job was to uh, work with the development teams and product management teams to continue to improve the services that we are offering to our customer. Uh, they, uh, they started adopting new technologies wherever required, right? They never, they were never, we never had to tell them. Right. Okay. Implement this. Implement that. Right. So things started moving into containers. You know, we started using uh, 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 bet the cloud infrastructure better, um, and we security as a practice during our compliance efforts. Uh, compliance efforts went into uh, became part of the integrated uh, development process. Right. Integrated into the development process instead of it being a add-on activity and things like that. And uh, uh, so the lessons that we learned from this was, you know, continuous learning and improvement mentality is a prerequisite, right? And it needs to be there in everybody in the team, including the leaders, management, everybody, right? And infrastructure as code is a software project. So what happened once we got configuration management in, management in and we started doing a lot of things in our puppet, everything was automated using our configuration management tool. Over a period of time, you know, it became so huge that people would fear touching something in it because if any change would cause uh, 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 issues across entire fleet and things like that, right? So uh, it needs to be uh, uh, executed as a software project with the right uh, set of practices and people will not reuse code. There might be a class to install, up, install and configure Apache, but they may not use that because it's already being used at multiple different projects and they fear that changing that would cause impact on every other project. So they will build their own uh, class and use that, right? And that way it became a little unwieldy and over a period of time we had to, again, bring back best practices into it and clean it up and things like that. Um, and people need autonomy, consistent, uh, autonomy and consistent feedback and encouragement to pursue their ideas, right? You know, you don't need to uh, do a lot more, you know, if you give te teams enough time and opportunity and uh, guidance, uh, uh, they can uh, implement whatever is the right thing for the software project, for the projects. And uh, and you need to have implicit trust, right? You know, if, you, if there is no trust and if there is us versus them and developers don't trust ops and ops don't trust devs and PMs and leaders, it's very difficult to achieve anything, right? So you need to build an environment where there is implicit trust between each other and, uh, and we all are aligned on the shared priorities, right? On the shared outcomes. So I wanted to share a simple message to, you know, leaders and, you know, operations leaders generally struggle. They keep, you know, when I work with, you know, various leaders in, you know, organizations, they say, you know, they don't listen to us, you know, our voice doesn't get heard, you know, we don't, uh, our uh, uh, priorities are not important and things like that, right? But, you know, building alignment with stakeholders or management, it's, it's, it's a skill in itself, right? It's a, you need to, um, uh, understand the business side of it, yeah. We'll come to that. I think you know. So it's a, it's a, it's an organizational journey, right? This is not just a, you know. So I think, but you can make an impact if you are in a leadership role, if you are leading a team, or if you are a change agent in your organization, right? You need to, you know, understand the business nuances. Like, what is the business outcome? What are the? So if you don't have information, you have to seek information. I hope the organization allows you to do that, and you need to invest time and you need to back up with facts. You need to, you know, go back to your stakeholders and say, okay, these are the problems that we see and this is what we can do to solve it. And this is the time that we need and this is the resources we need, right? Unless you are able to push, unless you are able to show that, 
nobody knows about it right most often in my experience people product managers don't know about what it takes you know on the infrastructure to run the product well even management sometimes if they are not technically inclined they don't know about it unless somebody tells them and shows them very clearly from a business standpoint what is lacking and why and how it is affecting us right and building that alignment is a key skill that people need to build right and and uh, and you know when you do that you will get most often 95 90 100% of the time you will get support right they might take the tweak the plan they might ask you certain questions which will improve your plan but you will get support because you are again thinking about the organization in the end right it's not for your own benefit um and when you when you get that approvals and things like that when somebody says okay why don't you go and do it you know you have to be able to execute fast and and that builds trust right once you have a successful outcome once you solved a major problem and say you know uh, improved efficiency or whatever it might be and that builds trust and when you keep repeating that you over a period of time your you know entire you know uh, organ- this thing the, your operations improves and the, the the leaders trust you more with your decisions and things like that right um similarly you know how you would do that on uh, say if you have you know a lot of these microservices on the cloud right and the, the most of the practices are you know similar right you have to start with first if you are um, this this is say if you have already you know hundreds of microservices running on a cloud right in various fashions whether vms or containers and things like that and if you are in a situation where it is stressful and things are failing every day and you are you know managing incidents you also have to improve infrastructure there is a lot of manual work work is piling up people are not happy they're saying hey, ops are not delivering what i want and things like that if you are in that kind of a situation right then some things are wrong right the way it's been as an organization as an engineering team the way it got built and put into production and how it runs today is there is something wrong and so often the cause the cause is often uh, i mean there are multiple causes uh and the the uh, it, all, it, all, it all can be boiled down to not focusing enough on then building that capability right as i was saying before so you have to start stop somewhere review all the production operations practices that you have to see what all manual work you have what resiliency do you have where are the bottlenecks what are the single point of failures and 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 what are the manual work right that your team currently does where are we wasting time right and then slowly start you know prioritizing those i would prioritize by first you know stabilizing the production operations right you know that means that knowing what applications are running in production having the right monitoring in place you know and uh, having the right change management incident management practices in place which you know lets you deal with those interruptions and incidents in a much more structural and defined way right instead of running around in a chaotic fashion trying to find out the right people if you have all those identified and documented and you know you can there are a lot of tools available today which can translate from alerts into escalations to relevant people and everybody can come together and solve the problem together right and that becomes a learning process and that will these these things will feed into your automation right and if you have people focused on automating the work using again you know all the tools that we have available today like ansible salt uh 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 terraform and things like that things become easier and easier to do your workload reduces and you can focus more on seeing all these metrics of infrastructure seeing how they are run investing time in finding better ways to do it following our peers in the industry learning from them and you know continuing to iterate and improve right and that's being you know uh, 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 not ahead of the curve but at least following the curve right we often are lagging the curve but you know we should be at least somewhere where we are you know uh, uh, always following the curve right um so uh, the thing about this again in this kind of an environment is like the context is key and there are so many people so many siloed teams who are as i was saying you know engineering and deploying these microservices in production It, often nobody has full visibility of what's happening right uh and every team has its own siloed information and when things fail it all cascades down to everybody right and uh, and 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 that's where i was saying chaos engineering helps where you can induce faults and as a group you can learn how that if say bring down a service and then see how it fails in production what all the impact it has and then learn from it and improve your monitoring and things like that right and uh, 
and you know and and also what the leaders need to do is at least as the operations leader side they need to seek information they need to understand the business development uh, uh and the operation side of problems right if you see the problems on each of this business cares about delivering uh features to the customers right but that was but that was that's what makes money so feature velocity is important uh de development teams care about bringing their changes to code uh, faster into production right and we look at the operations teams they care about uh, uh avoiding risks or they care about uh, safety they care about how it runs in production availability and all of those things so how do you you know take all of these things and then still make progress right you can um so that 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 requires uh Uh, 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 it, 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 that requires a lot of uh, you know uh, uh, collaboration you need to be talking to your relevant peers and managers and then ensuring that the priorities are aligned right um so the, the message again i want to leave here is with the infra ops agility in a you know micro services world is a must required skill or capability that the organization needs to build right it cannot be an afterthought right okay we built this uh, software we built this microservices let's put it into production and run it it cannot be like that right and uh, it needs the right skills it needs the right uh, you know structures and uh, uh, and and in organizations and leaders should not just optimize for feature velocity but also ability to manage their evolving complexity because every change every new microservices go that goes into that kind of an environment increases the complexity right and you need to be able to manage that complexity well you cannot say that i don't want complexity because it's complex in nature right so what are the three key ingredients right to get there um i would say the first one the most important one according to me is culture right and i these are the ones that i have uh come to value the most in all my you know uh, years of experience is one you need to have an very implicit trust with everybody you know not just within your teams but with your peers uh uh and uh, uh business managers and everybody you need to understand them well you need to understand what they need and how you can support them right and you need to be transparent you need to have be, i mean you know we again this is an organization culture right it needs to be in you know uh practiced by everybody in the organization it cannot be just done by one person right so it needs to have zero politics it you know it needs to embrace vulnerability right we all have our fears right you know and we often don't speak about that very openly right we fear about failing we fear about making a mistake we fear about you know uh, so many things right and if the organization doesn't make it easy or doesn't embrace that vulnerability that each one of us have it just becomes tougher for people they worry about too many things instead of doing you know what they think is the best and learning from failure right and if you cannot learn from failure unless an organization embraces that you know uh, uh, concept and embraces that vulnerability that we have and you know emotional safety right and one which nurtures people right you know it needs to have how often how often do you all get feedback from your managers once in 3 months sorry every week good uh, how many get once in a year during appraisals okay <laughs> Uh, all right so that's i you know once in a year that's but that's bad right that's mean that you're in the dark for a year and then you know suddenly somebody uh, during you know appraisal times they say hey, you know you didn't do this well you didn't do that well so you didn't have enough chance to do anything about it right so um, it needs to happen as frequently as possible and they need to they need to be you know you don't want to hear bullshit right you want to hear uh the right things like what are you doing well what are you not doing well and what support do you need those are the questions that you would want you know your manager to ask and you know coaching in terms of you know how to do better in whatever you are doing and you know one which promotes learning and you know improve the work that you are doing um and you know gives the right ownership and outcomes and i think this this builds lifelong friendships right and you know when in you know, and that that you know a lot of my Uh, the people that i work with a lot of the friends that i have you know are you know are, are from work right you know this because of all the uh, uh, multiple years that we have worked together through in various different challenges and things like that next is structures 
right? You know, what structures help in an engineering team to achieve the right outcomes? So uh, when we look at what is engineering leadership, you have two sides of it. One is the technology aspect of it and one is the product aspect of it, right? And, uh, and, and then you have these second in line managers, you have dev, dev, development operations and again product, right? There might be product leads in each of these things. So the reason why they are co-joined in all of this is that they really need to be aligned well. It could be just one person if they have the right skills, right? If they don't have one person, if it is three different person, they need to be really sharing their uh, uh, priorities. They need to come up with shared goals, shared priorities and things like that. Even if they are three different people, with independent outcomes or independent work streams, they need to, you know, at least agree on what needs to be done, right? If they have conflicting priorities, work will not get them, right? Everybody will be going in different directions. And then you have these outcome-driven teams, which uh, uh, driven teams, which have your developers, operations, UX, and whatever other skills that you might need uh, 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 in as one one team, right? They, we, they call it squads. You can call it anything, right? I mean, but you know, it needs to be a self-sufficient team which knows the outcomes. The outcomes might be like, uh, 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 example would be, you know, the, the, your uh, shopping cart, right? Giving a great shopping cart experience in uh, for our uh, uh, service. If that is the outcome of that team, they, they will continue to iterate, learn and manage that shopping cart service that everybody else consumes, right? And they, they, they need to have that shared goal. So your development, operations, and product managers need to really have that shared goal. If they don't have it, then each of these people will work in very different you know, ways and you don't meet the right outcomes. Then what skills do you need, right? Um, uh, uh, sorry, priorities. Sorry, I, skills was the next one. How do you manage priorities? As I was saying, if these guy, if this, just one person, it makes it easy because he would have one goal and he can direct the teams towards uh, those goals. If it is three different people, they need to align on those shared priorities, what we want to do. Uh, and then you need to manage all this work, right? You have ad hoc and incidents, you have feature bugs, you have other manual work that is there. You need to do one-on-ones, you need to focus on recruitment, you know, uh, uh, and you also have compliance and financial activities. So all these things need to get factored in, you know. Uh, if these don't get factored in, then these won't get done. If you don't do one-on-ones, you're going to lose people, right? People are not going to build the capabilities. If you don't do, uh, do recruitment, you're not going to scale, you're not going to find the right people. Similarly, you know, any of this cannot be compromised on it all. It's all important work for a team, right? And and the only way to do that is to come up with you know uh, 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 shared goals uh, and you know in making all these activities inclusive uh, in your work and whatever ad hoc and incidents and that whatever operations and you know uh, manual work that it generates can feed back into your automation right so as a team the, these managers and the outcome oriented teams need to be able to self prioritize right. Okay, this is causing us, you know, a lot of headache. This is causing us stress. This is causing us frustration. Let's fix that. Then, you know, then you are in a much better uh, mode to do but better value work, right? If you are constantly under the stress, if you don't have time for your families, if you are constantly working for 12 hours every day, you get burnt out, right? How long will you do that? So, and, 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 and so things is, should move from more that ad hoc manual uh, type of work and stressful to more planned with cl clear focus on what is the uh, outcome and the long-term vision, right, for each of the uh, 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 things that we have. What skills helps, right, and what skills are required at each this, this level? We often don't look, look, focus on the uh, 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 this, right, in terms of, if you say engineering leadership, right, on the, for the technology side of the leader, they, we require, I would say that, you know, it doesn't matter that much if he's just a software engineering expert, right? He needs to have the operational skills as well, right? He needs to know how it is deployed in production, how is it operated in production, what makes it work well in production and what doesn't, right? And a, and a, you know, a technology leader needs to be aware of those things, right? He might not be an expert at it, but, you know, he needs to know, right? How and how tough it is, it's not easy, right? It's not magic. Just because you're using cloud doesn't mean that, you know, you will get all of that automatically. You have to plumb, a lot of uh, things need to be done by operations engineers to achieve that level of 
uh, agility, right? And he needs to have a product thinking trait. He needs to understand what product it is, why why we are building what feature, so that you know they they can direct the teams appropriately. He or she. Uh, uh, they need to be. Uh, good in emergent technologies they need to understand what is emerging how they can adopt it how they can how it will simplify uh, 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 our stack uh, the great people and leadership skills right they need to be able to set a vision they need to be able to uh, guide their teams pro coach provide feedback and never compromise on uh, the people management aspects of things right and uh, and and also the quality delivery right how do you maintain uh, uh quality with whatever velocity you want and uh, and create the right engineering culture you know iterative learning and all of those aspects on the product side similarly you would need good product thinking ui ux they need to also understand software development aspects if a product team doesn't understand what take what it takes to build software and you know then they are losing something right they need to really know what what it takes to build a software and how uh, 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 they can you know imp- make an impact similarly great you know all of this require great people and leadership skills right and then these uh, similarly in operations manager you they need to be experts in their relevant areas the dev- development manager would need to be a good software developer uh similarly other people and they need to focus more on people priority and outcomes uh and they will have all these teams will have you know inputs into the vision the technology vision or the product vision and things like that but they uh uh uh, uh, uh and and you know at the at the, at the uh, engineers level they all need to be specialists in their each areas Uh, uh and they need to be effective engineers so the effective engineers is a uh, uh, uh it, it, what do you want from an engineer right you need to be able the uh, engineer should be able to tell you know uh his stakeholders that what it takes to build it what the requirements are you should be able to communicate things very clearly he needs to be able to work with his peers and get that outcome delivered right instead of waiting for instructions and things like that so uh, an effective engineer would do that without being told and you know or with coaching he could do that right he would uh, 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 not worry about just his piece of work he will worry about the entire process that it takes to get work done right by building the right relationships and things like that and he will highlight it and he will tell you to your face if something is wrong or it's not the way that it should be done right so uh So or all I said in summary you need culture you need you know uh um uh, uh skills and you need the right uh, uh priorities to be able to change all of this in any of the organization that you are in and it is not just a one man or one ops leaders or a development leaders or you know an operation engineers uh, uh goal it is a, it should be an organizational goal and you know building that infrastructure operations agility and uh, is is a must required capability in this world and it cannot be done by you know focusing too much on the um just on the functional delivery of things but you know it also requires how it run, runs into production and things like that you have to care about all of that as well that's it thanks questions Yeah, we can hang out. I mean, Lucy uh, will be hanging in here, so I'm here all day. So you know, thank you.